Hi class, good day. Welcome to our discussion on AT02, Introduction to Audit and Other Assurance Services. In this topic, we are going to discuss the framework for assurance engagement, which will serve as the foundation for the assurance services that we will perform as a CPA, including the audit of financial statement, which will be the focus of our subject here in Auditing Theory. So let's revisit again our course outline. So we are now here on AT3402, Introduction to Audit and Other Assurance Services. So let us discuss. So Introduction to Audit and Other Assurance Services. For this topic, here are our references. So we have first the Philippine Framework for Assurance Engagements. Now the Philippine Framework for Assurance Engagements provide the definition of an assurance engagement including the essential elements no, which... Uh, which will determine whether a service offered or performed by a CPA is an assurance engagement or non-assurance engagement. So we are also going to discuss PSA 120 on the Framework for Philippine Standards on Auditing. So the content of our discussion will be as follows. So first, we will discuss the practitioner's engagements, and then to be followed by assurance engagements, then we will cover auditing and independent audit of financial statements. So let's go to the first part. So the first part is practitioner's engagement. So in, in our past discussion or in our previous discussion, so we covered the different areas of practice of CPAs. So here in our topic moving forward, we are going to focus on CPAs in public practice. Now for CPAs in public practice, so remember that we offer our services to the public in exchange for professional fees. Now what are the types of services that we can offer to the public? Now, the services or the totality of the services that we can offer to the public so are called the practitioner's engagement. And basically, they are divided into two major categories. So, CPAs in public practice can offer to their clients either assurance engagements or assurance services or non-assurance services. Now, actually, the difference is that we just have to know the definition of assurance service now, because the definition of non-assurance service is residual. So meaning to say, if a particular engagement does not meet the definition of an assurance engagement, then that would be considered as a non-assurance engagement. So what are the typical examples of assurance services? So the most popular one, we have the audit of financial statements. So that is why this one will be the focus then of our auditing theory subject. So we also have review of financial information and other assurance services. So other assurance services, so these are assurance services wherein the subject matter is other than the financial information. Okay, So because as CPAs, we can provide a service on a wide range of subject matter, not just about financial information. So some notable examples of non-assurance engagements or services that we can offer to our client. So we have agreed upon procedures compilation or preparation services, management consulting or management advisory services, and other tax services. Now let's discuss uh, first the concept of assurance engagement. So because we mentioned earlier, no, yung definition ng non-assurance engagement or ng practitioner's engagement are made in the context of assurance engagement. So basically, what are assurance engagement? So based on the definition provided by our Philippine framework for assurance engagement, Assurance engagement is an engagement wherein a practitioner expresses a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. Now, let us illustrate now, the definition of assurance engagement so for us to better appreciate now, the context of an assurance service. Now, what happens is an assur in an assurance engagement, is that there is a responsible party who is providing an information to the user with respect to a subject matter. So a subject matter can be uh, anything like, for example, a financial information or non-financial information that is of value to the users of those information. So meaning to say it's possible that the users use those information in making important decisions. No? So like, for example, in the context of audit, so the subject matter would be the transactions and events undertaken by an entity or a company so being provided to users of those financial information. So, But take note that the subject matter 
can take in many forms, no? not just financial information. No? Like for example, physical characteristics or the workings of a system could also be the subject of an assurance service or assurance engagement. So now what happens is that the responsible party to relay the information to the user. So they will prepare, usually, no, or generally, they will prepare a report. So by measuring or evaluating the subject matter against a criteria. So once the subject matter was measured or evaluated against a criteria, now there will be an outcome. So the outcome of the evaluation or the measurement of the subject matter against criteria is called the subject matter information. Like for example, in an audit, so the subject matter is the historical information or the past transactions and events. Now, the responsible party, for example, the management of the company, will measure that information against some, uh, some form of standard. Like for example, in the Philippines, the GAAP or the PFRS. So after measuring the transactions and events against uh, GAAP, the outcome would be the financial state. Therefore, the subject matter information would be the financial statements that will be provided to the users of the financial statements. But the problem is that uh, oftentimes, the users will not rely no, on provided by the responsible party So because there are inherent bias on the part of the responsible party to provide information that would be beneficial to them. So there is a, an inherent bias on the part of the provider of information. And there are also other hosts of uh, other resources. No? Like for example, the users might not have an expertise to evaluate the information if it's not, uh, for example, if it's not been, or if it's not, uh, it's not the nature of the users or it's not in the profession of the user or uh, nature of the user to understand those information. So there may be complexities involved. So that is why what happened is that the users expect that the information should be uh, what we call this uh, subjected no, to, to review or to some procedures no, by an independent third-party expert. Okay, So that's where the practitioner comes in. So the practitioner, what happens is that uh, we will be, will be engaged so to examine whether the subject matter is uh, fairly presented no, in accordance with the criteria. So to do that, the practitioner will obtain and evaluate and examine evidence so that shows whether the subject matter information so reflects the evaluation or the measurement of the subject matter against the criteria. So once the practitioner did that, so the practitioner will express no, his or her conclusion in an assurance report. And that conclusion is expected to enhance the confidence of the users of that information or subject information, okay? Or subject matter information. So that is why going back to the definition earlier, so we said that assurance engagement is an engagement whereby the practitioner expresses a conclusion you know, designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the users of that information. So about the outcome of a subject matter or evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. So let's apply the Let us apply to question number one. So question number one, which of the following is not an assurance service? So first letter A, audit of financial statements. So as we have seen earlier in our discussion of practitioners engagement, so audit of financial statements would be one of the examples no, under assurance service. So in fact, uh, audit of financial statements, so this is uh, the flagship service of the CPA belonging under assurance service. So meaning to say one of the most common services that we offer as a, as a CPA under the umbrella of assurance services. So definitely A is not our answer because we're looking for not an assurance service. So letter B, review of interim financial information. So review is also an example of assurance service. So letter B is also incorrect. So letter C, engagement to audit the entity's report on its uh, carbon emissions. So this is also an example of an assurance service, but this one falls under other assurance services. So since the subject matter is uh, not uh, about financial information, but nevertheless, so remember that assurance service can be rendered no, on 
wide range of subject matter. So even beyond financial information. So letter C is also incorrect. So the correct answer in question number one, which is not an assurance service, is letter uh, sorry, I think it was cut, but again, on the answer on question number one is letter D. So, because letter D in the previous question pertain to preparation services. And preparation services is an example of a non-assurance service. So, again, number one, answer is letter D. So, next, let's move on to question number two. So, question number two, which of the following professional services would be considered as an assurance engagement naman this time? So, letter A, an engagement to report on compliance of a client with the loan agreement. So, this one is an example of uh, assurance engagement, a compliance audit. So, in this case, there will be an expression of, of uh, opinion on, on the part of the practitioner. So, about the subject matter, which is the compliance of a client with the loan agreement. So, letter A is an example of an assurance service. So, number two answer is A. Now, letter B, an engagement to design the internal control framework for a client. So, this is not an assurance engagement, so but rather this is uh, more of a consulting engagement, no, which is considered as a non-assurance engagement. So, letter C is a preparation service, preparation of financial statements based on the accounting data extracted from the client system. So, therefore, this is also non-assurance. And letter D, Performance of an agreed-upon procedure. So, agreed-upon procedure is a non-assurance but related service. So, therefore, this is also not an assurance engagement. So, number two answer is letter A. So, finally, to distinguish no, whether an engagement is an assurance or not, so let us refer back to the Philippine Framework for Assurance Engagement. So, the Philippine Framework for Assurance Engagement provides five essential elements of an assurance engagement. So, meaning to say, all of these elements must be present in an engagement for it to be classified as an assurance engagement. Now, in the absence of one or more of these essential elements, then the engagement will be considered as a non-assurance engagement. So, these uh, five elements include number one, three-party relationship comprising of the practitioner, the responsible party, and the intended user. Second element is an appropriate subject matter. So, third is suitable criteria. Fourth is sufficient and appropriate evidence. And last one, written assurance report. So, we'll discuss each element in the questions that follow. Let us discuss the first element in an assurance engagement. So, the first element in an assurance engagement is the three-party relationship. So, this three-party relationship is comprised of, number one, the practitioner, number two, the responsible party, and number three, the intended user. So, question number three, which of the following statement is incorrect regarding the three-party relationship element of an assurance engagement? So, we are looking for the incorrect statement. Now, letter A, the intended user is generally the addressee of the professional accountant's report. Letter A is a correct statement. So, A is not our answer. Now, although the intended user is not necessarily the one who engages the professional accountant. So that meaning to say, the intended user may or may not be the one who engages the services of a professional accountant. So the one who engages the services of a professional accountant is called the engaging party. Next, letter B, the responsible party and the intended user will often be from separate organization. Letter B is also a correct statement. Although, again, the responsible party and the intended user may also come from the same organization. So, because in a national engagement, the relationship among the parties should be viewed within the context of each specific engagement and not based on the traditional lines of responsibilities. So, meaning to say, even if the responsible party and the intended user will come in the same organization, but they are separate uh, entities no, or personalities within that organization. Now, like for example, the responsible party may be the middle management and the intended user will be the board of directors. That would be fine as far as three-party relationship is concerned. So letter C, the responsible party may also be one of the intended user. Letter C is also a correct statement. So what is not allowed is that the responsible party and the intended users are one and the same. So, meaning to say the responsible party is also the intended user. So, in this case, 
the responsible party may also be one of the intended users, but should not be the only one. So meaning there should be other intended users aside from the responsible party. So the incorrect statement here in number three is letter D. So the practitioner expected to perform audit services only. So as mentioned earlier, in an assurance engagement, the practitioner can perform engagement on a wide range of subject matter, not just uh, audit. Next, let us discuss the second element. The second element of an assurance engagement is an appropriate subject matter. So remember, in assurance engagement, the practitioner can perform on a, a service now on a wide uh, variety or a wide range now of subject matter. So it's not just limited to financial information. So it can be about historical or prospective financial information. So this is a correct subject matter, correct example of a subject matter, even performance of a basketball team. So performance of a basketball team, although this is non-financial information, can also be a subject a matter of an engagement, of an assurance engagement. Letter C, systems and processes can also be a subject matter of an assurance engagement. So letter D is the correct answer. So all of this can be a subject matter of assurance engagement. So other than this, so pwede rin maging subject matter yung physical characteristics. No? Like for example, capacity of a facility. Okay? Or even uh, behavior. No? Like for example, compliance of the company in certain policies and procedures. So number four, correct answer is letter D, delta. So although uh, the subject matter can be from a wide range no, of items, but it should be appropriate no, for it to be considered a uh, subject matter of an assurance engagement. So the question is, when is a subject matter considered appropriate? So the requirement is letter A, it should be identifiable and capable of consistent evaluation or measurement against identified criteria. It should be uh, capable of being measured or evaluated. And then second, requirement, the information about it can be subjected to procedures and for gathering of sufficient appropriate evidence to support conclusion. So in summary, the two requirements for a subject matter to be appropriate. So number one, it should be capable of being measured or evaluated. And number two, there should be evidence available. It can be subjected to procedures. So correct answer is letter D. So both of these are required for a subject matter to be appropriate. Next, question number six. In an assurance engagement, the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria is called, so I mentioned natin to earlier dun sa flowchart or dun sa summary. Now, once the subject matter is evaluated or measured, so the outcome is called the subject matter information. Now, for example, in the context of audit of financial statements, the subject matter is the past transactions and events or the historical financial information. Now, after it is measured against the criteria, you know, which is, for example, the PFRS, then that becomes a subject matter information. So the subject matter information is the financial statements. Okay? So number six answer is letter A. So next, number seven talks about the third element. So the third element is the suitable criteria. When performing an assurance engagement, CPAs use standards or benchmarks to evaluate or measure the subject matter of an assurance engagement. So these are referred to in the framework as letter C, criteria. So number seven is letter C. So number eight. So a criteria to become suitable, so it must possess no, certain characteristics. So what are the characteristics for criteria to become suitable, no, and then, then to become or to be used, no, as a criteria in an assurance engagement. So one of them is relevance, okay? So kaya ang question here, which of the following statement here refer to the relevance characteristic of suitable criteria for assurance engagement? So is it that or a relevant factors that could affect the conclusions in the context of the engagements are not omitted? Letter A is also an ingredient of uh, suitability or one of the characteristics all, also no, for a criteria to become suitable. However, this is not related to relevance, but rather letter A is related to completeness. 
So because it, it is mentioned here that uh, important information or relevant factors are not omitted. So that is related to completeness, which is also again one of the characteristics of suitable criteria. Letter B, it allows a reasonably consistent evaluation of measurement of the subject matter, including when used in similar circumstances by a similarly qualified practitioner. Letter B is also a, a characteristic of a suitable criteria, but again, this is not relevant, so this is reliability. So letter C, it contributes to conclusions that assist the decision-making of the intended user. Now, this is about relevant. So letter C is the relevance characteristic. Now, letter D, it contributes to conclusions that are free from bias. So, this is also considered as a characteristic of a suitable criteria. And letter D relates to neutrality. Okay? So, therefore, the, the characteristic of suitable criteria, actually, there are five. So, we have completeness, reliability, relevance, neutrality, four. And the last one is understandability. So, together, these five no, comprise the characteristics of a suitable criteria. An example of suitable criteria, in audit of financial statement, the criteria would be the GAAP or the generally accepted accounting principles like the PFRNs. So, number nine, criteria that are embodied in laws, regulations, or issued by authorized or recognized bodies of expert that follow a transparent due process are called, so answer letter A established criteria. Now, the other form of criteria is specifically developed criteria. So, specifically developed criteria, these are criteria that are uh, developed or designed for use in a specific engagement. So, this is that promulgated by uh, authoritative body or embodied in laws or regulation. Now, for example, PFRS. PFRS is an example of an established criteria. So, because PFRS or Philippine Financial Reporting Standards are issued no, by authoritative body, no, like for example, our FSRSC, no, yung ating uh, Financial and Sustainability Reporting Standards Council. So, they are considered established criteria. Now, example of specifically developed criteria, no, for example, the management of the company had their system evaluated by an expert, by a practitioner, and they developed uh, policies and procedures against which the system will be measured or evaluated against, then that is an example of a specifically developed criteria. Now, the policies and procedures developed by the management for that specific engagement to evaluate their system. So, number nine, correct answer is letter A. Next, number 10. So, criteria may be made available to intended users to allow them to understand how the subject matter has been evaluated or measured. So, letter A is uh, correct sana, but hindi siya may. It is actually required. So, letter uh, first statement is false statement or incorrect statement. So, to make it correct, criteria is required to be communicated to intended users to allow them to understand how the subject matter has been evaluated or measured. So, incorrect na may lang. So, second statement, criteria may also be available to specific intended users. Now, for example, the terms of a contract or criteria issued by an industry association that are only available to those in the industry. So, letter uh, second statement, rather, is a correct statement. So, in this case, only statement 2 is correct. Answer is letter B. Next, question number 11. So, question number 11 discusses the fourth element, which is the sufficient and appropriate evidence. Now, take note, class, that the sufficient and appropriate evidence will be the basis of our conclusion. So, therefore, we are required by the standard not to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence as a basis of our conclusion in an assurance engagement. So, for question number 11, in determining the nature, time, and extent of evidence gathering procedures, so this will be the base of our conclusion, what do we consider? So letter A, materiality. So this is correct. In gathering evidence, we consider materiality. So because only material items would normally affect our conclusion. Letter B, assurance engagement risk. Assurance engagement risk is also considered in gathering evidence. Now assurance engagement risk is the risk that we will express or the chance no, or the likelihood that we will express an inappropriate conclusion 
when the subject matter information is materially misstated. And last one, letter C, the quantity and quality of available evidence. So all of these three factors affect on how we obtain evidence as a basis of our conclusion in an assurance engagement. So therefore, for number 11, the correct answer is letter D, delta. Next, number 12, is still connected with obtaining sufficient and appropriate evidence. Which of the following statement is incorrect? So true or false statement. So letter A, the practitioner plans and perform an, audit, an assurance engagement rather with an attitude of professional skepticism recognizes that circumstances may exist that may cause the subject matter information to be materially misstated. Now, letter A is a correct statement. Now, take note that professional skepticism is a very uh, important and fundamental concept uh, in the performance of assurance services and also in audit services that we will be discussing moving forward. Now, professional skepticism means that once we receive information from the responsible party, we do not immediately accept that at, fair, at face value. No? We have to verify first by obtaining supporting evidence or corroborating evidence before we use that information for the purpose of forming our conclusion or our opinion. Okay? So we will talk more about this one when uh, we discuss no, our, our future topics So related here in the review in auditing. Next, letter B, assurance engagement risk is the risk that the practitioner expresses in an appropriate conclusion. So when the subject matter information is materially misstated. Now, letter B is also a correct statement. So letter B discusses the concept of assurance engagement risk. So it means that uh, we will express an inappropriate conclusion. So let's say we will be issuing a clean conclusion or clean opinion when the subject matter information would be materially misstated. So in that case, uh, this is the situation that we wanted to avoid in our engagement. Okay, so because it means that we have failed as a practitioner in case assurance engagement risk occurs. No? Because uh, take note that we expressing or we expressing an inappropriate conclusion is a situation that uh, means that uh, that that it's not desirable, no, or that is exactly the situation that we wanted to avoid. So because as practitioner, what we want to express is the appropriate uh, conclusion under the circumstances. So that is why if we want to reduce assurance engagement risk, then we have to obtain no, the appropriate amount and the sufficient type of evidence. So because this evidence, as we have mentioned in our previous slide, so would be the basis of our conclusion. So failure to have a basis, then that is the time that we will, that uh, most likely we will be able to issue an, an inappropriate conclusion. So that is why assurance engagement risk is uh, one of the factors that uh, we have to consider in obtaining evidence. And the letter C, the assessment of materiality and the relative importance of quantitative and qualitative factors in a particular engagement are matters for the professional judgment. So letter C is also a correct statement. So number 12, answer is letter D, none of the above. So as all of these statements are correct. Next, question number 13. Again, which of the following is incorrect concerning evidence in an assurance engagement? So, incorrect or false statement. So, letter A. Sufficiency is the measure of quantity of evidence. So, remember, another factor that would affect our obtaining of sufficient and appropriate evidence would be the quantity and quality of evidence. And letter A is correct statement now, about quantity and quality of evidence where insufficiency is the measure of the quantity of evidence. Letter B, appropriateness or competence of evidence is the measure of quality of evidence. So letter B is also a correct statement. So when we, when we, when we talk about appropriateness, that means the quality of evidence. Now the, the old term for appropriateness is competence of evidence. Letter C, Obtaining more evidence may not compensate for the poor quality of the, evidence, of the evidence. Now, letter C is also a correct statement. Now, evidence is affected by both a quantity and quality. Letter A is correct. Sufficiency is the measure of quantity of evidence and the impact of quantity of or the impact of or the quantity rather of evidence is being affected by number one, risk. 
So meaning to say, the higher the risk in the engagement, then the more evidence that we have to obtain. So the opposite is true. Now in case the risk is lower, then we may also obtain lesser or fewer evidence. Okay? Now the sufficiency of evidence can also be affected by its quality. So interrelated yung sufficiency and appropriateness. So the better the quality of the evidence, the less may be required. However, if the evidence is or has poor quality, it cannot be compensated just by obtaining more quantity of the evidence. Okay, letter C, correct statement din siya. Now, obtaining more evidence may not compensate for its poor quality. So, the incorrect statement is letter D, delta. So, sufficiency and appropriateness are not interrelated with each other because as we have just mentioned, sufficiency and appropriateness are indeed interrelated. So, number 13, correct answer is letter D, delta. Now, the last element of the assurance uh, engagement or of an assurance service, the fifth, the fifth one, we have the written assurance report. So, written assurance report, first statement, is required for assurance engagements. So, this is a correct statement. And written report encompass hard copy reports and those in electronic format. Correct then also. So, even if in electronic format, so that is considered a written assurance or a form of a written assurance report. So, both statements are correct. Number 14, answer is letter C.